You're listening to the Wellness Real Estate Podcast. And today we're talking to Andy Pace, who is a healthy home concierge and founder of the Green Design Center. If you're an agent who is looking for ways to provide more value to your clients and to stand out as someone with expanded knowledge and a large network of home professionals to refer, then you really want to meet Andy. He has been helping homeowners and contractors all over the country with healthy and green building advice, and he has a complete online store of green building products. So imagine you have a client who's looking to remodel or build, and you know they have family members with chronic health conditions. Wouldn't it be great if you could refer Andy to that family? When you make that call to tell them that they can look up the Green Design Center for low VOC flooring, maybe you need to educate them a little bit on how VOCs affect indoor air quality and their health. But when you do this, you're showing your care and you are now in their circle of trust. Plus, it just feels so good to give good to others. For those of you watching on YouTube, I have to apologize for this um, is an audio only episode. This was recorded last year and I posted on my other podcast, The Well Life. And for some reason, I just can't find the video, but it's such a good interview that I wanted to share it with you all as well. So sit back and relax and get ready to learn about the true cost of building a traditional home versus a healthy one. Welcome to the Wellness Real Estate Podcast, where you'll discover a groundbreaking strategy that is transforming real estate marketing. In every episode, we focus on topics that will help you have more authentic engagements and meaningful conversations about your business. As the wellness real estate impact grows with projections reaching 850 billion by 2027, don't miss this opportunity to revolutionize your approach, generate more leads and increase sales, becoming the community connector you're meant to be. I'm Sheila Alston and I'm your host. I'm also the founder of Healthy Home Media, where I help agents all over the country leverage this new trend in the industry to spark new conversations that get people to listen to you and notice your brand. So if you're tired of spinning your wheels without the consistent leads to show for it, then stay tuned. This podcast is your guide to standing out in a rapidly evolving market guaranteed to change the way you think about real estate marketing. Okay, I'm so excited for today because today I have Andy Pace. He's the Healthy Home Concierge and founder of the Green Design Center. He's the leading resource for homeowners and contractors looking to source products that are healthy and green and receive expert consulting advice on designing and building healthy green homes. Andy is the host of the weekly Non-Toxic Environments podcast. He is a worldwide expert on green and healthy building products and services customers and contractors from around the globe. As founder of the oldest healthy building supply company in the United States, Andrew, or Andy, <laughs> has become one of the single most helpful and educational experts dealing with the day-to-day -day concerns of those individuals who suffer from allergies, asthma, and chemical sensitivities. So there's so much you can talk about here, but today we're going to cover the true cost of a healthy home and building one versus a traditional way of building. So welcome, Andy. I'm so excited you're here. Well, thank you very much, Sheila. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, I'll just clarify that, yes, professionally, I go by Andrew, but when I'm dealing with friends like this, I like to say, <laughs> Andy, please. Uh, it's it's uh, certainly more uh, of, a, of a wonderful conversation we can have here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I think it's such a, an important aspect of, of the reality industry, the, the real estate industry, is to truly know when people are talking about healthy homes, green homes, so forth, what that really means and, and how does it really affect the bottom line? Yeah. And I'm super just personally interested because we're building a house right now mm -hmm. and we don't have a technical, you know, green builder um, building it. And so mm -hmm. I do want to listen to our episode when we're done and send it Excellent. to them because I, I want to build in a green way. I want to make sure that I'm building a healthy home. I'm spending mm -hmm. all this money to build a house anyways. And I sure. want to make sure that I'm not um, going to be adding in toxins or, um, doing thing, you know, just missing out on an opportunity to take advantage of something that's going to make it more energy efficient or, um, more sustainable. Sure. And, and so the first thing I can say is I'm glad you don't have a green builder. <laughs> really? Yes. Uh, and, and here's why, because it's, it's in just looking at or listening to the, the last 15 seconds of how you described your home. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a home that's energy efficient, mm -hmm. that uses environmentally friendly practices and sustainable materials, but mm -hmm. is also healthy for the occupants. Mm -hmm. In the industry, green building, when especially when it comes to the builders now, green building is all about energy efficiency. That's one leg of a three-legged stool. Mm -hmm. So if we look at building a green home, 
There are very few builders today that are out to build the least efficient home they can. Mm -hmm. There are very few homeowners that'll go into a Home Depot or Lowe's when they have to replace their water heater or their or their uh, dryer and say, I want the least efficient one you have. Everybody yeah. understands energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. But the problem we run into is when we conflate the ideas of what green really means. Mm -hmm. And so we like to talk about healthy homes, healthy for the occupants. Green is, is something that has been adopted by the industry. And of course, we want to make sure that our homes are efficient from an energy standpoint. But we, when we deal with builders who specifically talk about green, they almost always avoid the health aspect because to them it's about performance and calculations and meeting metrics and making sure they you know they, that that everything meets certain energy codes and so forth all important from an energy standpoint but mm -hmm. has nothing to do with human health well i that leads me to the question are there some energy efficient um things you could put on your house that technically aren't very healthy for you or is it just that they're missing this healthy component well, sure. I think that um, this this is where we start to get into the to the terminology of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember years ago when um, big box store started putting green labels on things. They called them their um, uh, eco eco labels or something like that, and they would slap an eco friendly or eco label on a bag of, of fiberglass insulation. Oh, <laughs> okay. So in, it was called an eco option. Um, first of all, insulation is not an option, at least up here in Wisconsin and some mm -hmm. other areas it might be, but just because it saves energy doesn't necessarily mean it's eco-friendly, right? Mm -hmm. Just because, um, a, um, in let's take appliances, you can buy an induction cooktop, which uses magnets, um, uh, and electricity for heating pans, which heat the food, but there's nothing healthy about it. When you touch the pan, you become part of the circuit. Now, if you have any electromagnetic field issues as a person, it's going to, you, you'll feel like your body's buzzing. Oh, so, really? yeah. So the two are never the same. It's possible that just by happenstance that some will overlap. Um, but usually when you're dealing with energy efficiency, you have to make decisions that may not be the most friendly from a human health standpoint, the same way that if you're making a sustainable choice, let's say you decide that you want to uh, build material, build a house uh, out of all recycled and reclaimed materials, because you don't want to use any virgin manufactured materials for your home. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't verify that all those materials are free of health hazards and toxins. You can't verify that those materials were actually made in the United States. They could be made all the way around the world. So you're, you're, there's always a give and take in this. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I created a, a, a product rating system called Degree of Green, which there's 27 different reasons why you can call a building product or a system green. And I use that in air quotes. You boil it down to the three main categories, human health, environment, health, and sustainability, everything falls into one of those categories. Sometimes they overlap like in a Venn diagram, but mm -hmm. a lot of times they don't. And you have to then take the not so good with the, with the good that you're trying to achieve. Right. That makes perfect sense. So then how do you, I mean, you personally have to then, it's great if you know all the options and where they lie so that you can make better decisions, right? Right. Um, yes. because everybody's different. Like someone just, I just interviewed someone who told me about the induction cooking and how that was so much healthier because then you don't have the gas in your home. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking into that. But so now I'm curious, can you talk a little bit more about the induction cooktops? Well, I can. I, again, it's, it, you know, this comes down to the fact that again, this is green versus human health. Mm -hmm. This has always been uh, a situation where the two sides are butting heads. This goes all the way back to when I started the company back in the early nineties. Mm -hmm. I remember I brought in a line of completely natural synthetic free wool carpeting that was not made with any pesticides or chemical dyes. The backing is hemp, hemp jute and natural latex right from the rubber tree. Mm -hmm. It's as, it's as natural and safe from a human health standpoint as carpeting can get. Yeah. However, you've got, the large manufacturers of plastic carpet saying, yeah, but we can make carpet out of 100% recycled nylon. It's taking material out of a landfill. 
We're doing something useful with this stuff. Okay, so then who's right? Right. You know, it depends on the direction you're coming from. So um, again, reason why I developed Degree of Green is because there is no way that I can say unequivocally or uh, without question that this product will be better for everybody because it depends on the direction you're coming from. Right. So when a, when a client comes to me and says, we want to design and build a healthy home or a, let's, let's say, take that back. They say a green home. Mm-hmm. My question back to them is define green. Is it because of human health concerns of people living in the home? Is it because you're just trying to do the right thing to the environment mm-hmm. or uh, are you uh, trying to cut down on your monthly expenses from energy? I would say more often than not, people will tell me it's a little bit of all three, mm-hmm. but um, quite often it's, you know, we've got a seven-year-old with autism and he cannot be around any chemical outgassing because it exacerbates his symptoms. Or we have uh, in-laws that are going to be living in the in-law suite and one of them's going through cancer treatments and has no immune system left. So we got to make sure this home is healthy. That completely switches my train of thought. And now I'm looking at materials specifically for health of the occupant first Mm -hmm. um, to quote customers of mine from the last 30 years. And this is what they would tell me. I don't care about the environment. I care about my family and if they can live in this house now. By definition, a home that is human friendly will be environmentally friendly as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, though it kind of shares that attribute, but the flip side is not true. A home that is green almost always is not also human friendly because of the fact that on the green side of things, it's all driven by regulations, metrics, uh, and numbers, but not actually how it affects the human occupants. Wow, that's so interesting. I feel like you're just blowing my mind. So I'm gonna have to see your um your green rating yes. or healthy <laughs> home rating just to kind of maybe get a better picture of that. Um, so then do you think it's better to then I mean talk about a health healthy home then versus a green home? Or Without just, a doubt. Yeah, and just maybe have an understanding of what the differences are. So Yep. If if I want to build a healthy home, then mm-hmm. how do I how do I go about doing that, making sure that my in-laws have a mm-hmm. place to stay that's going to be beneficial for them? Right. So um, going back to the first thing I said, I'm glad you didn't go with a green home builder mm-hmm. because they would focus you on things that I would not necessarily deem to be healthy for the occupants. Luxury home builders, custom home builders are usually who I work with around the country. Mm-hmm. Because they're used to having clients that have a Pinterest page with a thousand pictures saying, I want a home that looks like this, do it for me. Mm-hmm. And so they're used to fielding questions about interesting ideas, um, new ways to do things, other materials that maybe I've not used before. And a good home builder, a good custom home builder would say, certainly I'll look into that. And let's see if we can make this work within the budget. If it's above budget, let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Green home builders will say, nope, it doesn't meet the protocol. You can't do it, period, end of story. Hmm. So, uh, and I know this from decades of working within the green building industry. So how would you work with a home builder to build a healthy home? So first off, it's got to be understanding with that custom home builder that here's what we're trying to do. We want to live in a home that's healthier for our family, for our kids, for the in-laws. We understand that there are materials used in the traditional building process that could be detrimental to the health of the occupants. And saying this to a builder, especially after the last couple of years of the pandemic, they're going to understand better. The -hmm. pandemic, if it did one good thing for us, it taught us that our homes need to be our sanctuaries and the healthiest space you'll ever be in. Mm-hmm. So um, builders are much more attuned to that, especially the luxury home builders. And so, and then working with somebody like me, what I do is because I come from the architectural construction industry, um, I speak that language. And, and so I'm, I would be your liaison. So a, a conversation between you, your builder, your architect, and myself would essentially be talking about what the materials and methods they normally use. Mm -hmm. And I can offer suggestions on making it healthier. And here's the reasons why it would be healthier. Here's why maybe it wouldn't matter so much in your situation. Here's what it would maybe cost difference wise for you to do this. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I would say, you know, to answer the original question simply, I'll say to build a healthy home should not cost a dime more than building another good quality home, period. That's wonderful. That's, now, so, that's so good. It's true. But if, but if you're comparing apples and oranges and you say, well, my, if you're working with a builder that doesn't actually buy high quality building materials, maybe they're just trying to find the best sale they can on this, that, and the other. And you're dealing at, at big box pricing for lackluster materials. And then you compare it to building a green, a healthy home. Mm -hmm. The healthy home will probably cost more, not because it's healthy, but because it's better quality. Yeah. I get that. That's so important. Oh my gosh. So let's talk about some examples of, um, you know, some green products or some products in general sure. that are part of traditional building that you, and give an example of what an alternative healthy product would be in that case. Okay. So to answer that question, I'll say this, when it comes to, and I'm not going to talk about too much about mold and EMFs to start with, because that's a long mm -hmm. conversation. Let's talk about chemical outgassing. Okay. Okay. Chemical offgassing is the, is the release of unreacted chemical monomers from a surface or a material after that material has been fully cured, fully installed in operation. So within the home, inside the space, 90% mm -hmm. of that chemical offgassing that you could encounter while living in that space will come from the things you see and touch on a daily basis. 90%. So we talk about building a home and there's 1400 components that go into building a home. There's only a handful of things that are really most important for mm -hmm. human health from a toxicity standpoint. Flooring is number one. In anybody's home, flooring is typically the largest contributor to unhealthy air due to chemical release. Number two, uh, walls and ceilings because of your paints and finishes. Mm -hmm. Number three, cabinetry, woodwork, millwork, your built-ins. Mm -hmm. And number four would be your own personal furnishings, your furniture, your window treatments, artwork, things of that nature. So those are the four things that we concentrate on if somebody's just looking to generally make the home healthier. Um, the first thing I would do is I would tell somebody to not use carpet. Mm -hmm. um, carpet in most people's homes is the number one uh, contributor to unhealthy air. Um, most carpet that's made today is going to release formaldehyde. Mm -hmm. uh, that formaldehyde can release from carpeting for well over 30 years. But the wow. carpet itself will also be a sponge for anything else that's off-gassing. It'll absorb it in the carpet and then slowly release again. So I have personally tested carpeting that's 32, 33 years old in somebody's house that off gases um, 10 times the amount that's considered at the healthy threshold. Wow. So it's not the off gassing isn't something that you can smell or that, you know, is off. Not always. Most often it's not. You know, if you think of, you know, um, carbon monoxide, which is the odorless silent killer mm -hmm. uh, or radon. Mm -hmm. None of these are have any smell, mm -hmm. but they are certainly highly dangerous to the indoor uh, occupants. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, like if you install new carpet in your house, you get that waft of that new carpet smell. Mm -hmm. That new carpet smell is typically a combination of between 600 and 1200 different chemicals that create that smell. Mm -hmm. uh, and that smell will eventually go away. But there's two functions of that. One is quicker than the smell actually going away um, totally is your brain will actually adapt to the smell and you'll forget about it. So this is where people who have true chemical sensitivities, their brain can never adapt and it just constantly overloads them. Um, most people after a few weeks don't, won't even notice the new carpet anymore. But if you go on vacation and come back a week later, the very first thing you'll smell in your house is your new carpet. Right. It's like smoking a cigarette. You take a first puff and you cough it out because the body says, nope. But after that, the lungs and the brain finally says, all right, you're going to do this. I'll get used to it. And it's the exact <laughs> same thing with chemicals. Right. Well, and depending on your 
own immune function, how stressed out you are, how all this, uh, you know, if you're sick or how, you know, pretty healthy, how much you exercise, how much water you drink, all these other elements that go into your overall well being. You know, you could be anywhere on this kind of spectrum of um, immunity. So if your mm -hmm. immune system is or immune function is really low, then you probably are going to be a lot more susceptible to some of these toxins in your home. Yes. And if if you have been um, affected by these chemicals in the past, mm -hmm. you're more prone to be affected by smaller amounts of related chemicals in the future. Mm -hmm. So this is what comes into what's called MCS or multiple chemical sensitivity. It's not just being sensitive to one specific I issue like, you know, just um, benzene or just this or that. It's anything that's petrochemically related can actually trigger the exact same response within the body. Wow. Okay. So if I don't get carpets and I get mm -hmm. hardwoods or something, but sure. I still want rugs. Yes. Rugs, okay. Rugs are okay, provided that you find rugs that are not made with the um, exact same materials that carpets are made from. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's the thing. I, you know, I remember a project I, I was on a few years ago where a um, family moved into a home, put in brand new wood flooring in the house mm -hmm. and about 5,000 square feet. And everybody in the house got sick and nobody could figure it out. The, the, um, the indoor air quality scientists, they all said, we don't find anything. I finally went up there and I tested the flooring and found that the flooring was completely free of formaldehyde off-gassing. Mm -hmm. But yet the whole house is full of formaldehyde. Oh. Well, it was the 17 area rugs they had scattered throughout the house that was releasing toxic levels of formaldehyde. Um, that evening, I drove back from Minnesota to Wisconsin. By the time I got home, they had taken all the rugs, put them out in the garage. The next morning, they emailed and they said, we feel better already. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, and furniture, it's not, I mean, there's lots of other toxins besides just formaldehyde, but how can you, how do you know if there's going to be, you know, when you look at a rug to buy online, it's mm -hmm. not going to tell you if there's formaldehyde in it. Uh, some will actually. Uh, oh, really? And so this is becoming a little bit more uh, prevalent in the industry. You know, the, the materials we work with, of course, would be formaldehyde free, but more importantly, I think, People want to know, is there some, some type of testing, a third-party test, somebody they can verify it's not just some company telling me what they want me to know mm -hmm. or what they think they want me to know. Um, these are becoming more popular. There's a, a, a certification called Green Guard Gold, mm -hmm. uh, which tells us that if they meet that um, certification, it would release less than seven parts per billion of formaldehyde. Now, the healthy amount in a in a home is less than 20 parts per billion in the ambient air. So you have to look at that number and say, all right, well, 20 billion parts per billion of formaldehyde in the ambient air means that everything in the home that's off gassing and just about everything will to some extent can, can you know increase that formaldehyde level. And, and I focus on formaldehyde because that is the key trigger. Yes, there are many other toxins, but formaldehyde is the key trigger for uh, allergies, asthma, sensitivities, and of course, it's a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have carpet and furniture and window treatments and wall finishes and your cabinetry and your countertops, uh, and then they're all releasing formaldehyde. Then somebody puts on hairspray and perfume that has more formaldehyde, so on and so forth. That chemical soup in the house starts to build up. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be a concentrated amount when it's at the surface, but it's when it's in the air, it's almost negligible, right? Mm -hmm. When we see formaldehyde levels that are at 40, 50, 60 parts per billion in the air, there's something seriously wrong. And that's usually because of a huge offender, typically like carpeting, or cabinetry, uh, or, you know, some, something else that happened that we would have to dig into. Well, so what I'm hearing too, is if I have my cabinets with, that are painted off site, that are the oil based or whatever the, uh, what do they call it? The conversion varnish that uh -huh. makes it super durable. Mm -hmm. I would do that offsite, but I bring it in. It's still going to be off gassing in my house. Yep. Yeah, uh, materials that are cured like that um, which is considered a, a conventional cure can off gas anywhere from two and a half to four and a half years after it reaches a full cure. That's a typical time it takes for, um, VOCs and sub VOCs to, to release from a surface. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So after that four and a half year point, it's pretty much done. Now that's of the coating itself. Mm -hmm. This doesn't take in consideration the wood glue, which is wood glue, which is ultra high in formaldehyde and the cabinet boxes, the base material itself, plywood, MDF, what have you, which also releases formaldehyde and the coatings typically don't cover that up. Well, so then how do you build um, healthy cabinetry and how do you get it to have a durable finish if you paint some of the water-based finishes? Like I'm open to having that on the walls, but sometimes you do that on your cabinetry and then you've got to paint your cabinets all the time because. Well, it really comes down to um, choosing the right materials, whether it's a water base or oil base. I mean, I can argue that the the new water-based conversion varnishes are actually more durable than oil base, okay. um, but they're not necessarily any healthier. And so, uh, because you can, again, this comes down to the metrics that are used to to create these numbers. And so one thing I, I failed to say right about off the bat is if you choose materials for your home and you're using a VOC amount as any guide to tell you whether the product is safe or not, you are actually causing more harm than good. And here's why. A VOC, a volatile organic compound, is regulated by the EPA specifically because of outdoor air pollution. Mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with indoor air pollution or indoor air quality. There's no regulation on our books dealing with VOCs and indoor air quality. The industry, the construction industry, the home goods industry has taken VOC and used it as a marketing attempt to say, if you buy zero VOC, you're buying, they don't tell you it's healthier. They say it's more eco-friendly which it is, mm -hmm. outdoor environment. Inside of a home, the VOCs are irrelevant because there's not enough UV or nitrogen to create low-level smog, which is why it's regulated. The chemicals that come off of products, some can be VOCs. There's about 287 of them. Some can be other chemicals. There's about 92,000 of those. So if you're reducing the VOCs to meet the EPA regulation, manufacturers are allowed to add back in other chemicals that are as toxic or more toxic, but not regulated as VOCs. So ammonia, acetone, butyl acetate are the three that are mainly used in paints and coatings all the time. And you know, acetone, that's nail polish remover, mm -hmm. highly dangerous solvent, zero VOC, according to the EPA. And it's used extensively throughout paints and coatings as a dryer. Mm -hmm. as a curing agent, because it gets around the regulations, but people are still getting sick. Wow. So then how will you, how do you know, like what, what, how, what products can you use? What paint should you look well, for? You know, for a full circle, this is why we exist mm -hmm. because, you know, people who have chemical sensitivity are definitely the canaries in the mine shaft. Mm -hmm. They're telling the rest of the world, something is wrong. Can't say what it is, but something is wrong. Because of that, uh, we've been able to determine, and, and people much smarter than I have, determined that all of these chemicals that can cause these types of triggers and these types of, of, of issues that are coming off of the things we use on a daily basis can actually be problematic. And so there is this, this is the problem right now. There is no metric that can be used as an industry professional to say, this is a healthy home, because what do you measure? Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, you have to know what you're measuring for. There's 92,000 chemicals. Which one are you measuring for? When they're measuring for VOCs, they're measuring for a broad base of, of EPA regulated chemicals, but that has nothing to do with human health. That's about energy, about uh, outdoor smog and air pollution. And so when somebody says, how can you make sure this home is healthy? We need, we go through with our clients and why we have a website selling a bunch of stuff too. Here are the products that we know are able to help you achieve that healthy home uh, that won't contribute to any indoor air quality issues because of these reasons. They don't release these chemicals. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you are looking for car, I mean, so you have products on your website is what you're saying. Yes, so we do. I'm trying yes. to find a car, like what if I want to have what if I want to have a carpet in like the closets or mm -hmm. sometimes the kids' bedrooms? Is there sure. a safe carpet to yes. get? Yeah, there's a couple of brands out there. Earthweave is probably the best one made here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Nature's Carpet from Canada. They both manufacture carpets that are pure wool, no chemical dyes, 
no moth proofers or insect repellents. Um, and the backing is hemp, jute, and natural latex. All wool carpets are not made the same. Most wool carpets made today have what's called styrene butylene latex, mm -hmm. which will have that litany of chemicals off gassing for 30 years. Oh, wow. Okay. But so are those carpets going to be, because there's no stain, you don't want to put all those toxic stain repellents and things mm -hmm. on because then that just makes it toxic again. But does that mean you spill something and then it's going to be ruined or? Well, actually the stain guarding and so forth that's done on carpets are only done on the plastic carpets, the nylons, the olefins. Natural wool carpet is actually the most stain resistant carpet you can buy naturally because natural wool, the fiber itself contains a, a skin oil called lanolin. Mm. And that lanolin carries with it all the way to the manufacturing of the carpet. And so when you spill something on a real wool carpet, it actually beads up on the surface for a very long period of time, giving ample time to get at it, daub it and so forth. And then mm. if it does stay for a long time, it does penetrate. Um, every wool carpet that's sold comes with a chart of anything that could possibly spill on it. Here's how you take care of it with normal household materials. Oh, okay. So that's wonderful. The other question I have is, um, what are some of the symptoms that, you know, what are some of the symptoms that people do get? How would they know if there's something in their house that's sure. you know, bothering them? Well, um, I'm sure you've had clients over the years who have said, you know, I moved into a home and within six weeks, everybody in the house got a cold. Or within a few weeks, it seemed like everybody got the flu because we were all so tired from the moving process and from, you know, the just the whole rigmarole, the whole thing. Turns out that's almost always a, a sensitivity to the environment. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, we might be tired because of the move, because of the process, our immune system is worn down, mm -hmm. and now we're susceptible to what's in the home. So typically, it's going to be that general malaise, flu-like symptoms, all the way to people who actually go into an anaphylactic shock because of what they're, they're coming in contact with. Normally, it's not that first. Normally, it's going to be that feeling run down. That could be the fact that their whole body feels like they're on fire. Uh, there are many different ways to react. It kind of depends on whether it's a chemical, a mold, electromagnetic field, or a combination. Right. But so they could just be having symptoms like a chronic headache that just doesn't seem to go away or yes. they all of a sudden start developing asthma in their house or something. Yeah, I think what happens is at some point, somebody deals with a certain situation for long enough that they've tried everything else. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, I didn't really notice this headache until I moved into this place. Mm -hmm. or I didn't really notice not being able to sleep until I started sleeping in this bedroom. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And, and so it's, it's a, it's a fascinating study of, of this, of chemical sensitivity and how it affects the body. And it, it's interesting that it's been estimated somewhere around 30% of the entire world population has a chemical sensitivity, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. Most people just chalk it up to something else unrelated because mm -hmm. it's easier to do that and explain it than it is to actually dig in and find out what the problem is. Um, a, a very a good friend of mine and a customer of mine in California, his name was Mike Bender, wrote an article for Men's Health Magazine a few months ago, basically telling the world about how he's been dealing with this since the age of seven. And it is just a debilitating disease. What he asked, what he went through just to be able to live in a house today is just remarkable. And, and how every little thing can set him off because his, his nervous system, his, he has anything from uh, mast cell activation syndrome to chronic inflammation response syndrome. His body just flares up instantly when it comes in contact with a toxin or a pollutant that he can't deal with. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, those are, I mean, it's unfortunate that people have to like deal with you know, having a chronic headache forever before they realize like to look at their home. So I do think like right. the first step is just becoming aware of your environment. So that's yes. part of the reason why, you know, I want to talk about this stuff in general is because I want more people to be aware. But on the flip side too, like I don't want people to get scared of the toxins in their home and then all of a sudden have fear about everything and kind sure. of, you know, people can become like a hypochondriac about all these things that can come and that's not good either. So what do you- Without a doubt. I mean- <laughs> What Obviously, you, you know, I, I get accused quite often of, of being a, a fear, either a fear monger or scaring people. I don't mean to do that. It's just, uh -huh. it's a serious subject. 
-hmm. The good thing is I have never been more excited about this industry Mm -hmm. uh, than I have been in the last year. I think that we are on the cusp of actually solving this problem. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, I think, is not a problem that we all are causing. I think it's just a general ignorance in the industry. Mm -hmm. And it's finally starting to come to light. Mm -hmm. I think that we are now at the at the point where people can talk about this with their building professionals, uh, with their friends and family, and not seem like they're coming off as a you know as as a some some psycho. This is this yeah. is a, a a true issue. Now, we all deserve, I believe, to live in a healthy home. Mm-hmm. Um, we deserve that to ourselves. Uh, does every home have a problem? Of course not. Every home could probably be improved. But mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you have to solve the problem. There is no such thing as a perfect, healthy home. I'll mm-hmm. tell everybody that, every client that there's no such thing as a perfectly green home. All we can do is uh, design and build a home that is well tolerated as best as we can, as best as we can afford, mm-hmm. and you know, do the very best we can. But we just want people to make smarter choices, and and we're here to educate those smarter choices. You know, it's almost, um, you know, I liken it to even a healthy diet. Like there's hundreds of different ways you can be healthy through your diet. And, you know, you don't want to judge other people because they're not following your subscribed, you know, nutrition diet, you know, because maybe it doesn't work for them. So I feel like, you know, even in the healthy home, green home industry, I mean, there's so many different choices that you can make and you make them personally because what's best for you. So you know, I don't think you want to judge other people for saying that's not green enough to be green. Because like you just said, there's no perfect green house and we're not trying to be perfect anyways. We're just trying to find something that works for us. Right. And and that's the thing. I think there's the only caveat there is there is such a difference between green and healthy. Mm -hmm. We have to make that distinction because again, if you just bring up green building to the average person in our industry, they're going to think energy efficiency you know, air leakage, mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. They're not even thinking of chemical emissions, building a home to avoid mold, so on right. and so forth. So, you know, we want to make that distinction from that point. Yes, there are many, many ways to achieve a goal that require, you know, different materials, different methods, but it's agreed upon based upon aesthetic budget, timing, things like that. Right. Oh my gosh, we're, we're running out of time and I know we could just talk forever, <laughs> but um, how do I get access to your chart that you were saying? Because what if I had like, for instance, this, you know, cooktop that we're talking about, the induction or gas, how do I know, how do I choose what's right for me based on? Yeah. So the degree of green program that I created, gosh, 19, 2001 is when oh. I first started working on it. Um, you know, I started it originally as a building product rating system where I actually kept track of the track of a couple hundred materials I actually rated. We just don't do that anymore because um, there's so much new information out there. So mm-hmm. I would say is um, whenever you're working with us, whether it's, you know, as a just a customer for the Green Design Center by material or working with me personally as a consultant, degree of green is what I use in the explanation to the client themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've been asked hundreds of times to write a book about this over the years, but I, every time I start, I have to start back again because things change so rapidly. Right. Um, I want to make sure the right information is out there. So once it's published, it can be misconstrued. So we like to bring that out personally to the cl- the customer on a literally a job by job basis. Okay. Well, so then how do people that are listening to this that want to learn more, how can yeah. they get hold of you? So the first thing you can do is go to our original website, thegreendesigncenter.com. Mm-hmm. This is where we have all of our vetted materials that we supply on sale. This is not the end all be all. This is what we have known for the last 30 years to be the most uh, uh, easily used materials by people with the, with the most extreme sensitivity. Uh, They meet our criteria for health. And of course, they will hopefully have the right price point and aesthetic for you. The second thing is you mentioned earlier, I have a website called, or excuse me, a podcast called Non-Toxic Environments, three Mm -hmm. words. I like to do one every week. I'm hoping to start doing it again every week. It's just been so darn busy. But um, that is a great resource. I've got a couple hundred um, 
audio podcast out there talking about every aspect of home building, remodeling, just living in a healthier home. It's essentially me and sometimes a guest host. Uh, and we talk like this for half hour to an hour, just talking about specifics, answering people's questions and so forth. And then hopefully after the first of the year, I'll be able to launch I've got a new weekly live uh, YouTube program that we'll be starting about healthy indoor air. Okay. Wow. I love it so much. I'm so glad that you are on the show today. I appreciate you. And um, I want to have you back again, because I'm sure we can have another conversation. About Anytime, it. please. This is fun. Great. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you learned something that will inspire you to think about your branding and how you can market yourself a little differently. If you enjoyed this episode, then you're going to love what I have for you because you don't need to wait to go get extra certifications or grow or expand your network to get started attracting new leads right now. You can simply begin by talking about wellness real estate trends and what you've learned on this podcast with others. I mean, this is an interesting topic that no one has heard about, and I have all the tools that can make it even easier for you. Wellness Real Estate Magazine is a brand new wellness lifestyle magazine, and it's the only magazine that brings health and home together. We educate readers on industry trends and how you can create a healthier home environment. Written by industry experts around the country, and we have three covers to choose from, Wellness RE, Healthy Home, and Wellness at Home, so you can easily find one that aligns with your unique brand and messaging. These magazines are the perfect done-for-you tools that help you not only stay top of mind, but help you be memorable. They also educate and engage your audience, which positions you as an industry expert. So differentiate yourself and grow your brand the easy way. Learn more at healthyhomemedia.com.